Good evening, everyone. How's everybody tonight? It's good to see your faces. My name is Naomi Hausman. Um, I'm here at Gratz College as the Director of Institutional Advancement. Uh, it is really a pleasure to have a event in our building. So for those of you joining online, um, welcome. I wish I could see your faces too, um, but we have a lovely group here in our reading room on the second floor of Gratz College. So welcome to all of you. Um, we have some new technology in this room. Um, this is, I believe, our first event using it. So you'll see above you some cameras and some microphones, and we've got screens on both sides. <clears throat> we have some of our presenters joining us virtually. You'll meet them in just a little bit. Um, so we're hoping all of this goes smoothly, and I'm sure it will, um, but we wanted to really provide the opportunity for people to join in whichever way they felt most comfortable. So uh, we had almost 300 people register for tonight. Um, and the 50 or so who said they would come in person. So it's a wonderful response to this really special evening tonight. So again, welcome. Before we get started, I wanted to offer a few housekeeping notes about the program. Uh, we will have some time for Q&A towards the end of the session. Uh, so time permitting, we'll take as many questions as we possibly can, both from, from you all here in the room and, and also if possible from those joining us virtually. Uh, and as always, we will be recording the program. So if you want to watch it again, you can. And for all those who register but are not joining us, uh, we'll, we'll send the uh, link to the recording uh, soon. And, and in case you haven't checked out our Gratz YouTube channel, we have such a rich collection of our programs, our lectures um, uh, going back several years. So um, if you need some interesting things to watch, we recommend you check out our channel as well. Um, so now let's get started. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the president of Gratz College, Zeb Ellis. Welcome. In October 1978, Lance J. Sussman, he had not yet been ordained, submitted the final version of a term paper entitled Jewish Intellectual Activity and Educational Practice in the United States, 1776 to 1840. The paper was the result of Sussman's summer reading, designed as a graduate course at Hebrew Union College with Dr. Jacob Rader Marcus, the Dean of American Jewish History. Marcus and Sussman assembled a reading list and research agenda that would leverage the holdings of HUC's Clow Library and the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati. The project was meant to increase methodological skills and maximize the student's general knowledge of the Jewish dimensions of the antebellum period on a national level. The result, the result was a 255 page term paper scaffolded by precisely 666 endnotes. I, like Marcus and our teacher, Jonathan Sarna and others have relied on Rabbi Sussman's paper, that paper, for research and writing. It is marked with a sort of supreme art of erudition that anticipated Dr. Sussman's later scholarship on Isaac Leeser, the development of Reform Judaism in the United States, and his writing and public scholarship on anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. However, I call this paper to your attention for altogether different reasons. In the preface, a 255-page paper warrants a preface. The not yet Rabbi Sussman wrote, the intellectual activity of one generation is, among other things, intimately linked to the education it received in its youth. The intellectual activity of one generation is, among other things, intimately linked with the education it received in its youth. Rabbi Sussman's career and Cain Yerbu, there's much more to come and accomplishments in the rabbinate and in the academy is a result of a charmed educational career. The son of teachers in Baltimore, Rabbi Sussman was raised in a household that valued learning as the bedrock of a meaningful life. His career at Binghamton and as a senior rabbi at Reformed Congregation Knesset Israel 
is marked by an unwavering commitment to education. From the creation of Hillel's to early childhood centers, from adult learning to public scholarship on an international level, Rabbi Dr. Lance Sussman has architected a career deeply marked by an intellectual activity that takes its cue from educational practice. This is certainly the case for Rabbi Sussman's leadership at Gratz College. As a past board chair and professor at Gratz, Lance, you've charted a course guided by Jewish wisdom to elevate our Holocaust and genocide studies program, our efforts in Jewish studies, and so much more. Our college thrives because of your sacred work. No doubt, another sentence in your term paper also bears mentioning. In it, you thank Liz for sharing the burdens and joys experienced in this endeavor. Your wife and extended family are a part of Gratz's extended family. Owing to all this, Rabbi Sussman, I dutifully and eagerly stand here to present you with the Gratz Medal. This is only the seventh occasion in which the Gratz Medal has been awarded. Meant for a recipient who embodies the college's commitment to community, leadership, and learning. The medal bears a seal designed by Gratz College in 1900. This one, carrying with it a wonderful legacy and inscribed to recognize leadership and scholarship was furnished just for you. Mazalto. Is there an opening bid? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if anybody else has read that term paper in 44 years. So apparently you've really gone through it. So thank you uh, so much. Um, that paper was a real turning point for me. I was in rabbinic school from 75 to 80. And it was that summer in that independent study that Dr. Marcus designed for me that I made the um, decision that I would continue on to graduate school after ordination. And that was not the original plan. And I, and I liked it so much that in, I was ordained in 80 and received my doctorate in 87. And in preparation for the uh, ceremony for the doctorate, I turned to Liz and said, you know, I, I really like school. What do you think if I went to law school now? And she only used one word to answer it, alone. <laughs> So uh, that was the end of my formal training. Um, but you're absolutely right that uh, that, that was the, the moment when I made the decision that in addition to my uh, rabbinic calling that I would ground my, my work and my, my career, really my life in, um, in Jewish scholarship and um, looking back now over all these decades, it's very satisfying, I feel that I did the right thing for me, and it is tremendously gratifying to be recognized by others. We have other speakers, so I'll try to keep this part short. The same paper is where I met the Gratz family. So my connection to Gratz College goes back to the middle of my uh, rabbinic program. I read about the Gratzes, particularly about um, Rebecca Gratz, and um, they kind of became part of my own family uh, along the way, uh, offering outstanding leadership to the antebellum Jewish community here in Philadelphia and really creating national models. Um, American Judaism would not be what it is today in its positive aspects if it wasn't for the Gratz family collectively. And this college bears its name. So when I had the opportunity to come to Philadelphia to, to work at KI in 2001, in my mind, part of the deal was I would also involve myself at Gratz College, where I was immediately and warmly received, um, given the opportunity to teach right away in the graduate program. And then I don't know how it happened, became involved in, in governance. Um, which uh, I enjoyed and I'm glad to hear uh, was appreciated. This school is a gem 
it is an incredibly important asset for the Philadelphia Jewish community. And under Dr. Ellip's uh, leadership, I, I believe it's really going to be um, recognized as a premier Jewish institution of learning in this country and around the world. There are great things that are happening here quietly right now, but it will emerge and you'll know about it. And as Philadelphians, you're going to be extremely proud of what's coming down the pike. And, and therefore the, the value of this is really quite tremendous. Um, I wasn't in the military, so I never received a medal before. It's kind of heavy to get a pin for the back of it, but I will find a way to prominently and proudly uh, share this with um, everybody. So thank you for being here for this momentous moment in my life. And thank you to Gratz College for this wonderful recognition. Tonight's program represents the important work of Gratz College's Center for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights. This evening's Forum on Antisemitism in America features three presentations created by dispassionate scholarship meant to inform an urgent moment. Our gathering concerns much more than the disturbing rise of racism and antisemitism in the United States. Discussions on antisemitism provide an important perspective on the possibilities of freedom and privilege in the United States. The rise and fall of American anti-Semitism tracks how American society has negotiated religious tolerance, whiteness, and social status. From a historical perspective, the history of hate directed at American Jews complicates how we think about who is white, what if at all is a Judeo-Christian outlook, and who is welcome in various American neighborhoods. To be sure, other groups have experienced more violence and bigotry in this nation than Jews. Yet, conversations about indigenous anti-Semitism yield paradigm-breaking lessons that other dis discussions simply cannot. That is my personal goal and eagerness for tonight's panel. It is a very exceptional program, and I'm very pleased then to introduce our three presenters. Our first presenter is Dr. Samantha Binnaker-Miner, the Senior Director of Knowledge, Ideas, and Learning at the Jewish Education Project, an alumna of the University of Pittsburgh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, and Gratz College. Dr. Binnaker-Meinrath's research on the topic of her presentation this evening centers on Jewish identity and Generation Zers. She is the author of Hashtag Antisemitism, Coming of Age During the Resurgence of Hate. I'll introduce our other speakers now. Our second presenter will be Dr. Charles Gallagher. Father Gallagher is associate professor at Boston College. Father Gallagher holds a PhD from Marquette University, but for the purposes of this panel, I hasten to point out his master's degree from Bing Binghamton, where he trained with Rabbi Dr. Lance Faith Sussman. Father Gallagher has held many distinguished fellowships, including the Lowenberg Memorial Fellowship at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Likewise, <clears throat> likewise, he has received numerous awards, including the John Gilmary Shea Prize from the American Catholic Historical Association. His subject this evening, in concert with his recent monograph, Nazis of Copley Square, The Forgotten Story of the Christian Front, will throw light on Nazi extremist groups in the United States during the 1940s. And finally, Rabbi Lance Sussman is Rabbi Emeritus of Reformed Congregation Knesset Israel. He is a recent past chair of the Board of Governors and Professor of Jewish History at Gratz College. As of 10 minutes ago, Rabbi Sussman is the seventh recipient of the prestigious Gratz Medal. As a scholar and public intellectual, Rabbi Sussman has published books and articles always accessible and well-written. He serves as senior scholar of Roots of Reform Judaism and was a past national chair of the CCAR Press. He formerly served as a trustee, I don't know how you do this, of the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania and the American Jewish Historical Society, and is an active member of the Academic Advisory and Editorial Board 
of the American Jewish archives. His remarks will respond to his co-presenters' findings and share the family history that undergirded his own research on anti-Semitism in American history. We begin tonight with Dr. Samantha Vinikar Minor. Hi everyone, it is truly a pleasure to be here today uh, virtually with all of you um, and I'm really honored to have the opportunity to speak to the community in this capacity. Um, as was said in my introduction, um, I have the honor, the pleasure of working with Jewish teens um, and have had for a number of years. Um, and as part of that work, had the opportunity to do a great deal of research and soul searching when it comes to the topic of Jewish identity development and anti-Semitism. In my work with Jewish teens, I have found Gen Z to be significantly different uh, in their experiences, their outlooks, and their practices than my millennial peer group. Generation Z refers to those who were born from the mid to late 1990s to the early 2000s, and is the first generation to be born as true digital natives. They were born into a time of unprecedented growth in technology and connectivity. At the same time, their lives have been marked by school shootings, climate uncertainty and change, divisive politics, and ever evolving questions of both identity and allegiance. They've grown up in the shadow of 9-11 and its aftermath, having never experienced a time when the United States was not at war in their early years. And for Jewish Generation Zers in particular, their formative years are now being shaped by a resurgence of anti-Semitism. Too many Jewish Gen Zers know all too well the uncomfortable silence that often serves as the aftermath of realizing that you've been hit, so to speak, with an anti-Semitic incident and needing to process at, uh, in terms of how to respond and what to do next. A few examples from my research. Jenny from Boston shared that sometimes her experience is that of denial. Sometimes I don't want to accept that what someone is saying is anti-Semitic, so I just don't let it register that way in my mind. She shared a memory of a classmate walking up to her in the hall during her freshman year of high school and saying, hey, Jen, you're Jewish, right? When she answered in the affirmative, the response was, don't worry, I still like you. Ella from Los Angeles remembered and shared with me about a boy telling her, you're hot for a Jewish girl. For many Gen Zers, these awkward encounters can leave them reeling uh, when it relates to their Judaism and also as it relates to Israel. It was shared with me that people aren't prepared or confident in dealing with anti-Semitism. Ella told me there was an incident in my high school where a teacher was using a Hitler meme and all of the other Jewish kids reached out to me to ask how to deal with it. When it's just you by yourself, it's easy to just want to ignore it and to shut down instead of engaging. For over 10 years, I've had the honor and the sacred responsibility of educating Jewish teens. I've had the chance to get to know this next generation, their fears, their dreams, the pressures they feel both internally and externally, something that's ever growing. The role of the Jewish educator in my experience is marked by its multifaceted nature. I have worn the cats of counselor, camp, college, and life, event planner, teacher, spiritual advisor, big sister, mom, rule enforcer, marketer, tour guide. I've held the hands of girls overwhelmed with first love and first heartbreak. I've listened to boys grapple with what it means to be a man and how to reconcile their inner and outer selves in ways that feel authentic and will also be accepted by their peers. And I've been a thought partner as these young people explore how their Jewish identities manifest and what role this aspect of their intersectional identities will play in shaping their lives. There have been high points and moments of tremendous pride. I've sat under a night sky at a campground asking shared questions about morality and personal responsibility, hearing from the next generation of would-be mystics as they piece together emerging worldviews and try to make sense of the world around them. I've shared seats on long bus rides that have been places of plotting future goals and have been present at the birth of ideas that should they come to fruition will surely change the world. I've seen leaders blossom, nurturers evolve and countless adolescents come into their own as well-rounded complex individuals ready to take on the challenges that life has and will surely continue to throw at them. But I've also held back my own tears of teens have come to me 
with questions in their eyes about hate and prejudice and senseless anger. What does one say when they're asked to make sense of a teacher who shut down the voice of a Jewish student, telling the student that there's actually no conclusive evidence of the murder of over 6 million Jews during the Holocaust? Or when they're charged with helping a teen figure out how to respond to someone who used a pickup line as abhorrent as, how do you get a Jewish girl's number? Check the inside of her arm. How do you fill the silence that comes when the black mark of a swastika leaves the pages of the history books and finds its way onto a locker or a notebook or the home of an adolescent just trying to find their place in the world? I've made choices in each of these instances. They may not have always been the right ones or the ones that each of the educators that I had the privilege of profiling in my book would make. And ultimately, I think that's okay. To educate Jewish teens is uh, Jewish Gen Zers in particular is to operate in largely uncharted territory. It's to join them in this new world, one where social media is the barometer for legitimacy and social distancing is understood nomenclature. It's a place where identities are complex and overlapping and everyone is responsible for making the world a better place, whatever that means to them. Generation Zers as a whole are living in the most diverse iteration of the United States that there has ever been. They're also living in one of the most polarized times in the collective memory of the American and the Jewish people. Jewish Gen Zers in particular are entering emerging adulthood against this backdrop with the added baggage of coming to terms with a resurgence in anti-Semitism that has left the American Jewish community searching for new answers to ancient questions. And I'm excited to take the time to share some of the voices of the Gen Zers um, that I had the privilege of working with. If you give me one moment, I'm about to share my screen. So I provide the disclosure, I did not set out to study anti-Semitism. When I was a doctoral candidate at Graz, um, I was studying Jewish identity development amongst Generation Zers. And one of the questions that I asked was, what comes to mind when I say Jewish space? What is a Jewish space to you as part of my qualitative research? And I got all of the answers that I expected, and I'm sure many, um, if we were able to be in a dialogue right now, could throw out easily. Synagogue, school, camp, my grandma's house, all classic Jewish spaces and exactly what I expected to hear. And then I asked the follow-up question, do you feel comfortable in the space that you thought of when I said Jewish space? And I thought we would have an existential conversation. Am I comfortable in that my gender identity is affirmed? Are my Israel opinions welcome? Are my politics part of the mainstream? And instead the answers that I got were what I have come to refer to as heartbreakingly practical, less about these uh, meta conversations about feelings of belonging and much more in the mindset and the space of, you know, since the shooting at Congregation Tree of Life in Pittsburgh, the synagogue that my family goes to has had armed guards at the door, so I feel comfortable. Or, well, the day school in my community got government funding for bulletproof glass windows, so it's too bad that we need to have them, but I guess I'm comfortable because we do. And I started to realize that the generation gap uh, was being reflected. Gen Zers did not feel like they had the privilege of thinking about questions of comfort in the same way that I did. They were thinking about physical threats, their own safety, and this looming specter of anti-Semitism. So I wanted to understand more and went into a deep dive focusing on this particular topic. So a few key stats just to share why this felt so pressing. Um, these are from the AJC's most recent um, report on anti-Semitism in the United States. 90% of American Jews believe that anti-Semitism is either a very serious problem or somewhat of a problem as of 2021. That feels staggering to have 90% of Jews agreeing on anything is a feat that one would hope could be achieved in something other than feelings about anti-Semitism. 60% of the general public reflect the same feeling that anti-Semitism is either very serious or somewhat of a problem. While it is still more than half, the gap of that 30% felt staggering to me to say that uh, a lot of the work that our Gen Zers and Jews as a whole have to do in this uptick in anti-Semitism is just getting everyone on the same page to get the general public to realize how much of a problem this is um, when there's that much of a difference in perception. 
same thing. Um, there was a difference in terms of generations. Older Americans are more likely to say that anti-Semitism is, um, is a problem with 70% of those ages 65 plus, as opposed to only 52% of those ages 18 to 35, meaning Gen Z is this generation that is taking on um, emerging leadership roles in the world, at work, in school, in academia, first have to just convince their peers that they know what they're talking about. One in every four American Jews reported being a victim of anti-Semitism between 2020 and 2021. This could mean any number of things. It could be, a, God forbid, a physical attack. It could be a um, anti-Semitic social media post uh, or reply that was paced on their timelines. It's anything and everything, but it's still a staggering number that that many individuals, I assume some many, unfortunately too many of us here, um, can put ourselves into that category. And finally, the ADL's most recent anti, uh, audit of anti-Semitic incidents in the United States recorded more than 2,100 acts of assault, vandalism, and harassment. So what do our Gen Zers have to say about all of it? I've divided this up to share some quotes that I'll provide commentary on, on the key topics that I had the privilege of speaking to our Gen Zers about. So first up, we've got On Israel. Ariel is a Jewish Instagrammer from Connecticut. Um, when I spoke with her, she was a high school senior and shared that when it comes to Israel, I don't like that as soon as someone hears that I'm Jewish, they automatically bring up Israel. They're not one and the same, but they're not fully separate either. When it comes to anti-Semitism, Israel too often becomes the scapegoat. It's very awkward and should be awkward and abhorrent in society today to say, I don't like Jews, but it is very socially acceptable in many circles to say, I don't like Israel. And with Israel and Jews being increasingly equated, we're seeing many teens um, and many Gen Zers who are struggling with that equation to say that I care about Israel. I know that I am in relationship with Israel. I'm not sure what my relationship with Israel is or looks like. But there's something to be said that I don't necessarily want it to be all about Israel when someone hears that I'm Jewish. So how do we take um, the uptick in anti-Semitism as it relates to Israel and figure out a space where our young people are confident and excited to talk about Israel instead of it being a source of potential um, consternation with them? Next up, we have on the Holocaust. I get confused about other people's sensitivities regarding Holocaust imagery. When people said you can't call the detention facilities on the southern border a concentration camp, well, why not? If that's what it's going to take to get my parents, my aunts, or my grandparents to listen to what's going on, why not? I think that's a fine way to use our history. Mara, who when I interviewed her was a sophomore at SUNY Binghamton, um, is the child of two rabbis from the Midwest and was struggling. She loves her Judaism. She feels deeply connected to the collective story of the Jewish people, and also identifies as a progressive, as an activist, as someone who is deeply entrenched in the here and the now, not necessarily the past that led up to it. She knows, as so many Gen Zers do, that they have the responsibility, the burden, the honor of being the last generation that's going to have meaningful personal interactions with Holocaust survivors. And as the imagery of the Holocaust shifts from being specifically that of the past to something that is utilized to speak to common um, current situations, issues, both uh, about Jews, not about Jews, used derogatively towards Jews, really all of the above. I think we can all picture some Holocaust imagery um, that has been used of late. This question of who owns this collective memory and what do we do when it's weaponized do we believe it is being weaponized, um, became a very interesting thread for many Gen Zers who were comfortable with the universalism of something that in the past has been seen as so deeply particular. On making Jewish choices. Every time I see anti-Semitism on social media, I feel like I have to make a choice. Am I going to comment back and get into a whole spam war over it? Or should I just let it go and keep scrolling and not engage. Ilana was a freshman in high school from Maryland when she and I spoke. And what she spoke to is a real struggle of how much do I want to show my Judaism off? I know that I'm Jewish. I'm proud of it. I'm good with it. It's great. 
but if I'm going to get attacked for it, is it worth it to share? There's a phenomenon right now, particularly on teen Israel trips, where high school students um, are making secondary or fake Instagram and TikTok accounts in order to document their travels. They see themselves online. They express themselves online. They can't imagine not showing their trips online, but it has become so um, toxic to post about Israel or being Jewish on social media that they've decided to opt out of sharing it in their real quote unquote lives. We have questions about physical safety. And this was from Abby, who's the mother of two Gen Zers growing up in New York. Since the shooting at Tree of Life, we keep our voices down more when we talk about being Jewish in public. Be respectful of others. We are who we are, but we don't claim it as much. And this is the real life in person version of essentially the exact same thing that Ilana shared about making the choice of when to be loud and proud, show that Judaism, and when the choices because of this uptick in anti-Semitism and the real fear that is experienced um, is rising, the decision to keep it a little bit more quiet. On social media, everything here, one feeds into the other. I posted a video about making gefilte fish on TikTok and people responded with free Palestine. And then they said they wished that Hitler had killed both sides of my family, the Jewish and the Romani in the Holocaust. Elisheva is based in central Ohio and identifies as part of a multicultural Jewish Roma family. She started an Instagram account specifically to speak to that dual identity that she holds. And this is where things um, led to for her. She found that she couldn't post culturally about a Jewish experience without it somehow, again, back to our first slide, being equated with Israel, specifically the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and then threats, personal threats against her and her family. Identity, and we went back to Mara from Binghamton. My optimism has been informed by my Jewish values, the things that I was taught, and the idea that we're on an upward trajectory towards making the world a more whole place. Anti-Semitism is not the be all end all of the Jewish uh, coming of age experience, nor would any of us ever want it to be. Our young people see a value add in their Judaism. They are inspired by it. They're proud of it. They are more connected with it than we give them credit for, albeit they're connecting in different ways and we have to learn how to measure them differently. But anti-Semitism still remains a backdrop to those connections and to that experience. On parenting Jewish Gen Zers. Success would be if my kids see Judaism as an obligation, but not a burden in their lives. I see college students who will say they're only Jewish inside their homes and in these little bubbles, but they don't want to put up signs advertising Hillel events or show their Judaism outside of those limited spaces. I want my kids to be comfortable being Jewish wherever they are. As more and more identities overlap and intersect, um, there is a sense that you can put some on and take some off. And that's really frightening. We want Judaism to be part of who our young people are wherever and however, and in whatever capacity that manifests. So to see that Judaism is being segmented out because of fear is deeply disturbing. And finally, this one just made my day. On the Jewish future from Zeke, a Maryland-based high school student, we are a damn force to be reckoned with. Gen Zers are proud. They see themselves not as leaders of tomorrow or of some far off future, but really as leaders in this moment and are taking the, that uh, call to action by the reins. Um, they know that there's a lot of work to be done and they are ready and excited to be the ones doing it. So I took this quote um, that's, I promise to love being Jewish 10 times more than anyone hates me for it. And it felt so profound um, in the conversations that I had with the teens um, and the young adults who I really had the pleasure of interviewing for my book and then subsequently um, working with to explore what is Jewish love, what does Jewish joy look like for them? So many of them are feeling motivated by the uptick in anti-Semitism um, to act, to explore, to understand what it means to be at this unique juncture of history. And uh, it's really been my honor to learn and lead alongside them. 
Um, I look forward to speaking more in the q and I'm just going to note that I am putting a link to hashtag anti-Semitism into the chat along with a discount code um, for anyone who is interested in reading the book in its entirety um, or is interested in otherwise continuing the conversation. Thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, I look forward to speaking in a moment. Hello everyone, thank you, Samantha, for that uh, very um, solemn and uh, thoughtful presentation on Gen Z. Uh, I just want to uh, start out by um, thanking uh, Gratz College and uh, President uh, Zev Elif for inviting me to speak. Um, in Rabbi Sussman's remarks, he mentioned his calling. And uh, when I worked with Rabbi Sussman, I was not yet uh, a religious or a priest, um, but I just want to say that his life modeled uh, someone called by God that I have been able to look to in my life um, for kind of my own vocation, uh, his devotion to God, his devotion to family, and his devotion to scholarship was really kind of what, what pulled it all together for me uh, as, a, as a model for going forward in the, uh, in the academic life. What I'm going to do, speaking of that life, I'm going to share my screen and talk a little bit about my um, second book, which um, similar to Samantha, I didn't really uh, desire to to, to work with anti-Semitism as a topic in my own uh, academic life, but it, I seem to have kind of stumbled into it. Um, my first book was on World War II and Catholics in the, in the Vatican and the Holocaust. And now this book is um, about a group called the Christian Front, which I always felt was neglected in American history. And they were Catholics and they were deeply anti-Semitic. And so what comes out is this book, uh, Nazis of Copley Square. Uh, I'm trying to recover their history. And I was walking around here at Boston College for 10 years working on this book. And people would say, what are you writing a book about? And I'd say, Nazis in Boston. And they'd laugh at me because nobody thinks there were any. Um, but what I was able to show is this is the Nazi who was assigned to Boston, more on him later. He's an SS officer who will retire from the SS, not retire, he'll actually, uh, at the end of the war, he's the equivalent of a brigadier general in the, in the SS. Very, very shifty uh, gentleman, um, very nefarious uh, uh, ideologue. And this is his target in Boston, a guy named Francis P. Moran. More on him later, he's, he's the ringleader of, uh, Father Coughlin's group, who we'll talk about uh, in Boston. And he had a, his headquarters in the Copley Square Hotel in Back Bay of Boston. And Scholz was basically funding his operation of the Christian Front uh, by 1940 through 1940, really up to its, till its shutdown in, in 1946. Um, and so uh, Scholz was giving Moran uh, resources and direction. This has all never been known before. I uncovered it in my researches, uh, getting FBI files declassified and going abroad, looking at archives in, in London and in Germany. So this is what I wanted to do with the book. Kind of this is another influence of uh, Rabbi Sussman on my work is to kind of keep the religious aspect present in the history and to make American history also kind of real religious history. So uh, in my case, I was looking at uh, Father Charles Coughlin, a Roman Catholic priest in the 1930s who was wildly popular uh, on the radio. He had about 30 million listeners and um, he was preaching a, a uh, nefarious, insidious myth of Judeo-Bolshevism, the combination of Judaism uh, being present at the creation of uh, communism, of Bolshevism. And, um, and that leading into real anti-Semitism on the part of Catholics. In the book, I talk about these two Catholic theologies of the day. What I mean by that is, you know, today Pope Francis is very prominent with his uh, pronouncements on climate change. And so that kind of dominates the Catholic uh, public space now. So these were two other, uh, in, in back in the 1930s, 
these issues, which I call Catholic action, which was a benevolent kind of originally an uplift uh, uh, thesis in, in, in Catholic um, doctrine, and then mystical body of Christ theology, which was based in the teachings of St. Paul, um, that those theologies kind of coalesced under Coughlin. And, and when Coughlin was on the radio, he was able to, in my words, mangle those doctrines so that they were able to become uh, sympathetic with uh, anti-Semitism and, and push Catholics to accept anti-Semitism to the, to, to the greater extent that they already did because the scriptures uh, also were connected to, um, to the killing of Christ and the deicide and, and blaming Jews for that uh, during the 1930s. But Coughlin, Samantha used the word weaponized, and I would say Coughlin weaponized a number of these theologies to move towards a more deeper and uh, insidious style of uh, anti-Semitism. And so this is kind of what I saw when I looked at this group. Um, when, when I actually, when I was working with Rabbi Sussman at Binghamton for my summer job, I was a police officer. And um, this picture kind of kickstarted my interest in this group because I was also being trained on, on various weapons at the time. Um, you know, my nickname was officer friendly on the police force. So I wasn't carrying these types of guns, but I kind of under, I, I knew what those guns were. Those are Springfield 1903 rifles. And uh, I was just astounded that uh, when I read the news article associated with this picture, that these were Catholic men who were charged with sedition, trying to overthrow the U.S. government. So, and they were charged actually with the same charge, seditious conspiracy as, as the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys are uh, currently. Um, but they were much more weaponized. And I thought, I scratched my head and thought, you know, I've never heard of this group in my study of Catholic history. And I, I wonder why not. And so it started kind of this quest in the back of my mind to kind of figure out who these cats were and, and what was behind, what, what type of antisemitism pushes someone to pick up a rifle and start, uh, attempt to start a revolution uh, in the country. So um, these are just, I'm gonna go through this uh, slideshow so you can see some of, the, some of the, the photos. Now, this is a guy named John F. Cassidy, uh, who's up here on the, on the top, on the middle picture, uh, the top uh, of, of my left, perhaps your right. Um, he's, uh, he's the one under 18 seized here. Now he was commissioned by Father Coughlin to be the leader of the Christian Front in Philadelphia in 1939 uh, at, a, at, a, uh, at, a, at a Christian Front meeting in Philadelphia and at the Opera House. And uh, over the shortwave radio, Father Coughlin explained that, Ca that Cassidy was gonna lead the uh, Christian Front in New York and in um, and, and, and the East Coast to be the, the leader. And then uh, they began to stockpile weapons and build bombs, which is something I go into in my book. Uh, ta I talk a lot about uh, their bomb building workshops and their acquisition of weapons, both uh, bolt action rifles and light machine guns. Um, because what I'm trying to do in the book is, is dispel this, uh, this historiography that said they didn't amount to anything. That from the 1940, when they were arrested, really through the 2000s, the, the journalists and historians who wrote anything about this group, if they ever did, kind of downplayed them. And, in history and down, particularly downplayed their lethality. And I, I kind of thought that, was, um, that wasn't that was right and uh, that they got that, that part of the equation wrong. And so when I got the FBI file declassified, it took me two, two years to get their FBI file declassified. It was pretty clear that in my view, because I actually had some firearms training, I kind of knew uh, what was going on here with, with the weaponry. They were doing uh, target practice. They were doing military, uh, paramilitary practice. Um, and uh, they would always break for church on Sunday mornings when they did their military practice. They'd always break for church and, uh, and then go back to the firing range and um, continue, their, continue their target practice. Uh, so just a little, there's just a little more of uh, some of the coverage. It was a big case during the time. Uh, 
Coast to Coast News in January of 1940. The trial was uh, from the uh, June of 1940, uh, May of 1940 to June of 1940, and they were acquitted, actually. In the book, I talk about the uh, just the ghastly uh, prosecution by the government uh, and how inept the Department of Justice uh, seemed to be. Uh, there's some real uh, kind of jaw-dropping uh, stories in, in that kind of style. The, the also, the, the prosecutor, the government prosecutor, decided that he would take religion out of the question. So he wanted to prosecute a group calling themselves the Christian Front. But he didn't want to create any religious divisions in the country, so he decided not to prosecute on any, to have religion enter into the courtroom in any way whatsoever. And in my book, I say, you know, you cannot disassociate these uh, religious um, paramilitarists from their religion. And uh, and so I think the government got it wrong, and the and the um, Christian Front got off in New York, and they got their guns back too. So then, but the publicity of that case kind of shut them down in New York where they were headquartered. And then the movement slowly moved upward uh, on the coast to Boston where they had this really uh, well-organized uh, charismatic figure named Francis Moran, who was a kind of a foot soldier as I call him of Father Coughlin. He was running Father Coughlin's political organization in Boston and um, decided to, to uh, keep on with, um, with leading the Christian Front in Boston. He tried to affiliate with the Archdiocese of Boston in the summer of, in the early summer of 1940, but they rebuffed him, Cardinal O'Connell rebuffed him. And so he was kind of, kind of twisting in the wind for a while until he was uh, picked up. He, he, he needed support and the, the organization probably would have not only faltered, but entirely dissipated if it weren't for the arrival of this man in his life, Herbert Scholz, who is a Nazi SS officer under diplomatic cover. He's the consul, sent to be the consul in Boston. And um, nobody knows who he is, but this is his lineage. He was an understudy of Ernst Röhm, uh, very close friend of Ernst Röhm, the head of the, uh, the originator with Adolf Hitler of the brown shirts. Uh, after about four or five years with Rome's brown shirts, he ended up going to the University of Leipzig and getting a PhD in Nazi philosophy. Basically, that's what I argue in the book. Uh, and then with his PhD, he became attractive to Heinrich Himmler's SS because they wanted to become the elite guard. And he was poached just before the Night of the Long Knives in 1934. He was poached by Himmler from Rome's uh, brown shirts. And uh, Himmler sent him to work in the Brown House, the, the Nazi party headquarters, where he was an understudy to Rudolf Hess, who by 1934 becomes the deputy uh, Fuhrer. And so he's working in the Nazi party headquarters in Munich. He's working in, you know, just above Hitler's office there. So th this is kind of the, the pantheon of, of Nazi henchmen that he, um, has been tut uh, tutored by, and he comes to Boston, and um, and Hess, who is in charge of the intelligence side of the Nazi party, trained Scholz to be a spectacular, he's really terrific espionage agent. I mean, he, as a spy, one thing I do in the book is show how Scholz, Scholz and Moran, there, they were, a, he was the um, intelligence officer, and Moran was the agent, that relationship was vibrant, probably the most, I argue, the most significant domestic spy relationship of World War II, and, and no one ever uncovered it. It was only uncovered, you know, publicly, you know, last year when I published the book. Otherwise, no one ever knew that Scholz, Scholz was running Moran as, as an agent. So here are just some couple more photographs of him. He was known as Handsome Herbert. He, his family was fabulously wealthy from from Bavaria. The woman he's with is his wife, is Lilo von Schnitzler, whose father was the commercial chairman of IG Farben, that made the gas for the gas chambers. And, um, and so she comes to Boston as well and serves as his kind of diplomatic wife. Just a photo of Scholz in the consulate on a Beacon Hill, which is literally a two minute walk from the State House in Boston. 
Uh, there he is uh, kind of relaxing in Boston. And then this is a picture that no one really knew existed um, that I was able to dig up. This is uh, Boston's Beacon Hill in the spring of 1940. That's the Nazi swastika flying outside the consulate. So very chilling image um, and kind of tells us what is uh, kind of uh, going on there. Uh, these are just some statistics. There were, there, the, after the acquittal in New York, the Christian Front membership on the East Coast skyrocketed so that by 1941, there were about 30,000 members. Prior to the arrest in 1940, the FBI estimated there were about 100,000 members. I think the listeners should know that um, what was going on was that Cassidy and Moran, but particularly Cassidy, would recruit members to the Christian Front who had prior military service. And then those members would be um, kind of captured to see if they would become members of the paramilitary cells, which is people we saw with the guns. So the, the larger members of the group did not know that those paramilitary cells were being constructed. Uh, that was all secret, uh, but nonetheless, they did exist. Again, no one kind of knew this stuff until, until uh, last year. Um, so the Germans, Scholz and Moran meet secretly together in uh, the summer of 1940, and they begin to kind of plot their nefarious activities all over New England. Hitler actually, Hitler's private uh, courier to the Wehrmacht comes to Boston in the spring of 1940 and meets with Scholz for about four days, and then they plot on how to penetrate the um, military structures all up and down the East Coast. And then that penetration, that penetration really starts in earnest uh, at that time. And they're pretty successful. I mean, in the book, I argue that Scholz's uh, tradecraft, his spycraft was really, really excellent. For example, Scholz and Moran outclocked these five intelligence agencies that were surveilling the Christian front, the FBI, the Office of Naval Intelligence, Count Army Counterintelligence, the OSS. None of them could put together that Scholz and Moran were, uh, were agent and um, agent and spy master. So then Moran is um, forced underground through what you can read in the book. British military intelligence sets up a front organization in Boston because the Americans are inept at taking down the Christian front in Boston. So you can read about it in the book. British intelligence runs an entirely seamless operation, which no one knew about. It's pretty amazing. And that forces the Boston police to detain but not arrest Moran. And Moran takes the Christian front underground, where I say, I argue he's more lethal, because this is what happens once he goes underground, in my view. He becomes exterminationist. He was uh, wildly anti-Semitic up to the point where he uh, had to be taken off the public scene by the police. And then once he goes underground, he becomes exterminationist. So this kind of notion of anti-Semitism and linking it with the Holocaust. I mean, this is a, a primary source document of a verbatim from him. Now you'll see here, according to T1, that's informant T1. That is an, inform an FBI informant that got into the underground cell structure of the Christian front. She was asked by Director Hoover. I know she's a woman, that's all I know about her. She was asked to uh, testify in a court of law against Moran and she demurred. She said no, because she was afraid she would get killed. Um, and so the prosecution uh, never went forward on any of that. This is about 1945, 1946. So the book making further contributions um, as I wind down here that you can read about in the book, the MI6 intelligence operation. There's Catholic on Jewish riots throughout Boston in 1943, which I insinuate are directed by, by Moran from receiving directions from Scholz through a shortwave radio that he had in his house. Russians, the Russians show up in South Boston. So there's a piece about Russian intelligence working on this case. And then um, Moran and Scholz both escape from justice. It's kind of like that, that awful kind of Holocaust story where these insidious characters just kind of always are skirting the law and they're able to get away and, um, and, and, and kind of live lives, quiet lives of, uh, of um, quite well, 
well accoutred lives. Um, and then finally, in, in the last minute here, current concerns. I do have current concerns. Uh, and my current concerns are this, that there's a, a recrudescence of Nazi activity or national socialists. They call themselves the National Socialist Club. It's only about 35 men. They've come on the scene in Boston in the last year, really since 2020. They call themselves the Nationalist Social Club or ACA 131. That's um, Anti-Communist Association 101. And the Christian Front melded that Judeo-Bolshevism, right? So it's kind of like that that, com that Jews and communists are, are, are symbiotic. And I think that's what ACA, like today, this these days in Boston is really getting at. And so that, that really makes me uh, very unnerved and very disturbed by, by this movement that uh, seems to be happening in Boston uh, in, the last, uh, in the last year or so. So now I will stop my sharing and hand all of this over to uh, Rabbi Sussman, who I believe will make some remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vinegar, Weinrich and Dr. Gallagher, um, it's pretty depressing, isn't it? <laughs> um, I, what I'm going to present now uh, is more of a synthesis. Both of the previous speakers have been directly engaged in primary research, um, and we just heard a snippet of their, their report, both very, very impressive. Thank you uh, to both of you. Um, what I want to present is uh, an attempt to combine uh, the personal with the academic a little bit. Um, my mother and uh, father um, gave us, myself and my sister, I think different messages growing up in the 50s and 60s in Baltimore. Um, my mother came to America from Germany in early 1938. The rest of her family came out in 1939. Um, German Jewish culture dominated in our home. My father was American born, child of East European Jews. It meant my grandmothers didn't have a whole lot to say to one another. It wasn't an overt problem, but there wasn't a lot of chatter there either. Um, German culture uh, played a major role um, in our home, um, whether it was Wiener Schnitzel um, or instead of deli, we used to get from a butcher in New York, it was called Elfschnitt, which is German style deli, which is very different than East European. The music I grew up with was Mozart, Beethoven, others. Um, my mother kind of drew the line with Wagner, even though my father liked Wagner, um, actually found a letter that he wrote from the front, um, from the battle of the, it was in the Battle of the Bulge, and they were already going out. The Baltimore City Opera was staging a Wagnerian opera in the middle of World War II, and he asked her to go and see it and report on it. But subsequently, if he put it on on the Saturday afternoon in the Met, um, she protested and it had to be turned off because Wagner was impossible. Um, my mother and my grandmother did not speak about their experiences in Germany. It was suppressed. Um, if they did talk about something along those lines, it was behind closed doors. And um, I uh, was not really allowed to learn German uh, growing up, although there were German words uh, here and there. I later started studying German in, in graduate school. Um, and it was hard, it was hard growing up to try to figure this out because on the one hand, it was clear anti-Semitism was the reason they were in America. It was the reason for all the silence. There was a lot of pain, occasional stories of other people who, who perished, uh, but no message uh, about hating Gentiles or hating Germans or anything like that. Just trying to live a quiet life and not deal with it explicitly. My father, uh, who was the child of East European Jews, um, was very open um, in his 
and his reaction to American anti-Semitism. Um, and it came from his army experience. He grew up in, in Jewish neighborhoods in, in Baltimore, so he really didn't know many Gentiles growing up. But in the army, uh, he ended up, although he was training really for OSS here in Philadelphia, uh, when the orders for D-Day came, he was thrown into an infantry unit made up of men from Oklahoma and, and Arkansas. And, um, you know, I asked him about his experiences. Um, and, and like my mother, he was very slow uh, to answer. I, I probably was in my late teens or 20s before I was getting any kind of um, substantive answer uh, from him about any of his experiences. Um, and I asked him, you know, what were these other guys like? And, you know, his answer was, look, before the war, I had never held a gun in my hand, and these boys could shoot the whisker off of a cat from 50 yards. Uh, they were just a different kind of person. I said, well, were they any Semitic? And his answer was, let, let me tell you a story. In my platoon, there were three Jewish guys, C Company, 95th Division, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, one of the men who was Jewish was the guy everybody hated. He was, he was obnoxious, and everybody hated him. The other Jewish guy besides myself was the guy everybody loved. He was funny. He shared. He was a backslapper. He was great. So I said, well, well what happened? How did it work out? He said, both of them were killed. They were both killed in the Battle of the Bulge. And it leveled the playing field. Years later... Um, he started attending division reunions, and uh, the, the custom was a spouse would be invited to be the queen of the reunion. And it was my parents' turn, and my mother received the um, invitation to be the queen of the 95th Division reunion. And they saw that the date coincided with the first day of Sukkot. So they wrote back to whoever was in charge and said, we're, we're honored, but we can't. It's a Jewish holiday. Phone rang. We're going to change the reunion. And it was, it came, it got a very different message from me. So I, I had to kind of balance these two um, experiences. And I had no real framework for it until I got to rabbinic school. I didn't study anti Semitism. I, I kind of was living in the, in the ripples of the pond from it in different directions in an unsynthesized uh, fashion. And my, my teacher was a shared a teacher over two different generations, was Dr. Sarna. And the way he framed um, anti-Semitism for us, and I had a lot of questions. I, I had existential questions trying to process my own, my own life. Um, he used the term, the doctrine of diffused animus. I don't know if he was still talking about that when he wrote Brandeis. The doctrine of diffused animus was in America, you could hate somebody different every day. So one day you could hate blacks, and the next day you could hate Iranians, and sorry, Father Coughlin, uh, Father uh, Gallagher, some days you could hate Catholics. And um, there are all types of people you could hate. And, you know, every once in a while, Jews would be the object of, of hate, but it was diffused. So we weren't in real danger. Um, the institutions, I was taught, of American democracy are very, very strong. We're not the Weimar Republic, and um, it's going to be okay here. It's different. America is different. It's a form of the much bandied about term now American exceptionalism, and Jews really do have uh, a home in America. And, and I gave many, many sermons uh, and talks uh, early in my uh, career, and early when I came here to Philadelphia to KI, where I, you know, I quoted the Wizard of Oz. There, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. America is the place where where Jews can be at home, and that's that's how things proceeded until um, the last few years, and and things have changed. And the um, the signal to me, again, beginning with life as it's lived, and then hitting the books afterwards to understand it. Um, came in the wake of the um, Tree of Life shooting in, in Pittsburgh, which I believe was in October. Um, my daughter-in-law, who uh, grew up as a lapsed Catholic in Birmingham, England, but had promised to raise 
the girls as um, Jewish, had um, adopted the custom of putting Hanukkah decorations on her front window, lit Hanukkah, subdued but lit, the big blue Jewish star in the middle. And um, it was just a few weeks after Tree of Life and uh, my daughter-in-law Kelly and my granddaughter um, Sophie, named after my grandmother Sophie, uh, were hanging Hanukkah decorations when all of a sudden um, Sophie apparently froze and said, Mom, I don't think we should hang them this year. She goes, what do you mean? She goes, a lot of people don't like us. And it went through the family like a shockwave, you know, based on what Dr. Winokur was saying. Um, this generation is growing up differently than when I grew up in the 50s and, and 60s. The, the horrible incidents of anti-Semitism, it's all over. Um, the, the internet. She's on TikTok much too much, so am I. Um, I like to watch babies singing and soldiers coming home. She likes to watch dancing, whatever, but we, we have a TikTok thing between us. And, and I, I said, well, th this, is, this really is a different moment, and I'm not quite sure I can say there's no place like home the same way I was saying it 20 years earlier. No place like home, question mark. And uh, I started uh, looking around um, for an intellectual way to, to understand it and uh, found some lectures and came here to various uh, programs. Um, and the, the word that popped was um, intersectionality. How do things connect? Because the paradigm that I had absorbed in, in rabbinic school and graduate school was diffusion, that we, we were safe from um, anti-Semitism because animus in general is diffused in America and, and Jews being recognized by the general society as being white people was somehow protected by this diffusion of of, um, of animus, but but now there were more incidents. You saw the ADL statistics, and and part of the commentary to that those statistics are of all the acts of animus that occur currently in the United States, which are greatly ele elevated. They are disproportionately, way disproportionately directed at Jews and Judaism, Jewish symbols, Jewish buildings, Jewish people, and in the United States. And a, another thing that Dr. Winokur put there was this comment about, in the one comment, it had both free Palestine and Hitler should have done more. Okay, that, that is about as bad uh, and good an uh, example of intersectionality that somehow the um, anti-Semitism which is, has arisen today on both the left uh, and, and the right are not diffused, but have many points of, of intersection, especially conspiracy theories, in which somehow Jews, going back to Ju the expression Dr. Gallagher used, Judeo-Bolshevism, that somehow Jews play an outsized role in perpetrating evil uh, upon the rest of the world, particularly uh, white people and particularly um, Christian people. And it's a very different paradigm today than it was when I arrived in Philadelphia 2000. Something has changed. Uh, I don't believe that the vast majority of, of Americans have become anti-Semites, but anti-Semitism, which was a almost forbidden topic so different from what you read about what senators would say on the floor of the United States Senate in 1930. Today, people can get public messages out there that are, are uh, viciously um, anti-Semitic. And the Jewish community um, is struggling uh, to try and figure this out. I think this is why the kind of research we just heard is is so important. How's it impacting generational cohorts? What's the deep root of anti-Semitism in American society? And it is quite profound. This is not Poland, this is not Germany, but nevertheless, it is, it 
is um, it is quite it is quite profound. And and what I notice is that uh, living in polarized times, it is not surprising that um, Jews on the American political right tend to focus very squarely on um, anti-Semitism generated either from the American left or anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism coming out of the Muslim community. And we know from politics in, in Europe in particular, there is an unholy alliance between um, leftists and uh, Islamists. And the focus from the Jewish right here is on the primacy, uh, on the primacy of um, left-wing um, anti-Semitism in America. And if you go to the left side of the political spectrum uh, in the American Jewish community, no surprise, uh, they'll say that, look at the statistics at ADL at all this violence against Jews. Who's perpetrating that? Well, it's coming from the right. It's specifically from the Christian nationalist side of the equation from Christian front, although exactly, Charles, you're gonna to have to explain this to me how Protestant and Catholics who were haters work together since they don't like each other to begin with, but somehow they too have intersectionality uh, at uh, this point. And they're, they're looking at the um, primacy of anti-Semitism coming from the American uh, right. In the middle are places like Jewish Federation the exponent, uh, synagogues. And whenever anti-Semitism is addressed, they always say it's from the right and the left. And there isn't primacy, but they're trying to assign equal, uh, equal blame, equal blame to it. Um, and there's no real analysis that goes there, but because of the politics of the moment, they have to make sure that nobody is offended and therefore doesn't make a donation and all that kind of all that stuff, so they assign equal blame. Um, what I am experiencing is that um, there is a generational um, difference here, that kids going off to college, and the Jewish community has an incredibly high rate of people going to, into college, as you know, are mostly experiencing anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism from the left, and that's their concern. It led us, at KI to make a decision to change the curriculum of our confirmation academy so that in 10th grade, in addition to the standard course on what I believe, which you would expect in confirmation, is a class that I taught for 10, 15 years on the Arab-Israeli conflict, saying explicitly to the kids, you're going to hear stuff when you get out of this cocoon in college about Israel and about Palestinians and about Zionism. And I want you to have something to reply to it if you're, if you're willing to speak up. And I think that is, is their, their experience. Statistically, however, for the older part of the community, the existential threat violence um, is from the right. Uh, and that's where those big numbers come from that ADL is tracking. Um, when I came to KI 20 years ago, the idea of having an armed guard at our door was unheard of. We had plainclothes policemen on the holidays. Uh, we had cops from Cheltenham out in the parking lot, and, and that was pretty much it. But as incident and after incident developed, uh, a consensus developed in the congregation that we needed armed guards. In fact, from the preschool parents uh, after the Tree of Life, they pretty much said, if you don't have an armed guard by next Monday morning, we're not sending our kids here. And half the kids are not Jewish. Um, and unlike anything else I've seen in synagogue life, we had to tack on a security fee uh, in addition to dues. <laughs> Uh, there are always complaints about dues. There are always negotiations about dues. They're the taxes of Jewish life. So people are going to complain. But we put on that security fee, right on the table. Do we have to have it? And people love the guards. We even gave gifts um, to our guards. It, it is a recognition that this is a different moment. And I, I think even 
deeper than that. Um, is uh, the beginning of a fear that our, in our constitutional institutions and traditions may not be as strong as we think they are. And that is really frightening because what is going to protect us other than the rule of law? And I, I think there's an, an awareness of that. I looked at an article in preparation for tonight written by Ruth Weiss, distinguished professor, Harvard, Yiddish studies, is the handwriting on the wall for American Jews. Should we be thinking of Aliyah? Should we be thinking of getting a passport in Portugal? Something like that. You know, where, where are we really? And that's, that is a marker in my mind, um, that would have been unimaginable 20 years ago. And she made the point that um, Aliyah to Israel should be based on the merits of Jewish pride and Zionism. If you want to move to Israel, go as an American Jew because you approve, you want to be part of the Zionist experiment. And on the other hand, if you want to stay, have faith in the American exper experiment and stay here. I have had several discussions this summer with different people from the Jewish community, different parts of the Jewish community that actually have talked about getting second passports. Okay, there's a nervousness. There's a nervousness here. In Europe, you know, if you're from England, you don't have an EU, so it's not a big deal to make a little investment somewhere and you get a, you get a passport. So I think, things have, I think things have changed. And, and I think Professor uh, Ruth Weiss is, is correct. If, if you think you need to go to Israel, go because you're a Zionist, go because you're pro-Israel. For the vast majority who are not gonna consider leaving this country. And Jews historically have had among the lowest rates of remigration of any group in, in American society, because until Israel, where are you gonna go? Back to Poland, where are you gonna go? Um, that it's worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for. And we're now faced with a, a real question as to how to proceed forward. Uh, is, is the strategy of ADL sufficient? Is the strategy of the American Jewish Committee sufficient? What are we going to be teaching our kids about how to be Jews and Americans and how to put that together? And is that sufficient? It was an unspoken synthesis when I grew, grew up. There was no light between Jewish and American. And all of a sudden, in this rarefied atmosphere of terrible political polarization, that people aren't even living in the same universe of, of discourse, all of a sudden, it's been problematized. And, and we, need, we need to think this through very deeply at every possible level. The, the synagogues in their messaging and their education need to deal with this. Gratz College and the training of scholars and, and researchers and public intellectuals, as you've heard tonight, needs to be thinking about it, and we need to be thinking about it around the dinner table. This is not the moment to be an ostrich. This is the time to think about what is a principled response to the shifting sands of our, of our own time. Um, and you're gonna have to find your own answer. Um, I'm both a Zionist and a proud American. I leave all my options open. I've spent my life studying American Judaism. I have a hunch I'm staying here and standing up for American democracy and the long history of anti-anti-Semitism in this country. Because in another lecture, in another night, we can we can talk about the long, the long, fuller history of American anti-Semitism and whether or not there is still a hope, and I hope there is, for American exceptionalism. Thank you.
blown away. I can't uh, thank our three presenters uh, enough uh, for their addition, for their thoughtfulness, and for interacting with one another uh, so profoundly. Uh, we have a few moments uh, for questions. I'll pause here. We'll uh, give preferential status to those who are in the room. I have to repeat the question. Ms. Uh, no, you said it very articulately. I just, uh, for purposes of technological limitations, uh, I'll, I'll express it pithily, is that uh, why is it, and this is directed to particularly Father Gallagher and uh, Rabbi Sussman, but uh, Savannah, please weigh in as well. Um, that's Vinegar Meinraff, um, is how did it come to be that people who identify as deeply religious, whether it's Jewish or Catholic or otherwise, how do they seem to find your term safe harbor uh, in the political right? Uh, how did that come to be? And I'll even add, what are the, what are the implications? And what? Yeah, I mean, I'll start out. I think that was one of my first research uh, issues that prompted a deeper dive into all of this was um, that that there was a breaking here of the law of love, right? And so, you know, what motivates somebody to pick up a, a rifle in anger? Um, I I kind of, you know, going off of Rabbi Sussman's remarks, I. You know, I grew up as a Catholic kid in Binghamton, thinking that democracy and Catholicism were meshing beautifully, and um, that there wasn't any, uh, a, a, there were no um, difficulties in that assimilation. So, so when when I see uh, a weaponization of uh, theology. Um, I, I, I find it as a uh, as, as really breaking the law of love first first and foremost. Now I can't write that in my books, but that's kind of like how well, that's kind of the the question that that motivates me. And uh, what I've been able to put together is that um, a lot of the, theologians have mangled the taken legitimate theologies and mangled uh, parts of those theologies so that so that they can provide moral permission to people who are under their sway. I'm speaking of kind of charismatic leaders, Coughlin, but see that the thing I wanted to get out of my book was these foot soldiers like Cassidy and Moran, they could also be very, very morally persuasive and and persuasive at the street level. And so uh, that's kind of what I'm looking at today. I, I um, you know, I think I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not so sure it's, it, it's always the political right. I mean, you know, in 2020 Antifa was charged with a, with a, um, a terrorist uh, activity for planting a propane bomb at the uh, immigration building in, in, in uh, Washington, it was either Portland or Seattle, but that, that kind of always seems to get forgotten. But um, so I'm, I'm interested in how, how, what about the moral permission that these political groups are using? What you see now is, in my view, a little more of a, a recrudescence of, the, of what was in the 50s, Christian nationalism. And um, that seems to be kind of on the upswing these days. And I'll, I'll I'll hand it over to to our other speakers to 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 talk about this as well. So um, I think you characterize the current moment correctly, but you're talking to historians, and if you you know you go back further in time, you could have also said the opposite of what you're saying now. There, you know, one of the reasons that the Catholic Church, and, and, and Father, you can correct me, doesn't always fit the pattern of um, American conservatism well, 
uh, is because the church historically has been pro-union and which has led them into all types of policy positions favoring labor and in some cases moving beyond labor into socialism and certainly we saw some of that in in central and in south america so you, you have that um, in the american catholic church in, in the american jewish community the vast majority of american jews uh, trace their lineage back to the czarist empire and the czar together with the russian orthodox church was so deeply anti-semitic that it was almost impossible for jews to shift to the right um, but then when they looked at the the communists they had a problem in that the communists were at the same moment officially anti-religion but also anti-anti-semitism so as russia fell apart jews went into the red zone as it because they couldn't go to the white okay the jews who came to america uh, in the waning years of the czarist empire brought socialism union less unionism but socialism and to a small extent communism there were about 17,000 or so american jewish bolsheviks um they brought they brought that to america in their luggage um and they jews were very prominent and important in the labor movement in this country and what had been old world socialism became american unionism and the supporters of the new deal and all that and our current day um, um, liberal politics which is the majority in the american jewish community is part of the luggage that has been unpacked from the Russian experience. So that, that explains the what we were saying you would think it would be the, the natural um, connection. It's historically um, dependent on those, those circumstances. And Judaism can argue for monarchy. It can argue for a lot of different, a lot of different things, right? Some people are waiting for the monarchy to come back. Um, but uh, times change and alliances um, shift. Um, Jews become part of the American environment and uh, acculturate, let's use the word acculturate instead of assimilate, and begin to pick up on the, the political culture here. And I think one of the things and in, in, in a specific thing that helped shift Jews to the right were racial tensions in the United States. Uh, you know, the, Jewish black relationship in the United States was tremendously complicated. There's some, there's a saying to the effect that it was never as good as Jewish liberals wanted it, and it was never as bad as black nationalists wanted it or thought it was. And um, there was intersectionality between rising black nationalism and the third world and Palestinian, the Palestinian cause in particular. And I think in the wake of the Six Day War, there was a need to reconcile Jewish priorities with American political priorities, and that led to neoconservatism, et cetera. There was also an increase in wealth. And um, instead of looking at Social Security as a primary um, leveler in the United States, um, lower taxes became more important. So Jews began to shift. I think part of the surprise is that um, the american jewish community and it's very frustrating to people in the american jewish right has has stated about that 75 25 ratio um, there, there were a number of moments in, in recent decades when they thought the jewish right was going to break through but it didn't maybe did best under reagan or a few, a few moments like that but then for whatever reason went back to its its moorings based on its immigration um, history. And now in particular, uh, I think um, because of the violence, the, the violence uh, in particular on the on the political right, which is is empirically demonstrable as greater than on the on the on the left in terms of incidents as cataloged by the uh, ADL, I'm not talking about threats and political statements, but actual, you know, 
violence. Um, uh, Jews have moved more solidly back into the moderate to liberal side of the political equation. So I, I think that's I think that's what has happened in terms of understanding without taking sides, but uh, with trying to understand the dynamics of uh, Jews and the American political landscape. Um, I'm asked to repeat the question uh, to Father Gallagher to compare, particularly at the Boston local level, uh, Christian Front versus uh, Islamic extremism in Boston. Yeah, it's, um, that's a that's a difficult question, um, mainly because I'm a historian, and um, um, for the you know for the the current events situation, I'm probably I'm just more clued into the to the radical right activity in Boston. Um, so, um, and I'm not I'm not really sure I understand the question. Is there is the question about seeing is the Christian Front similar to is the Christian front of the 1940s similar to modern Islamic fundamentalism, or is it is the question about um, about modern Islamic fundamentalism in Boston? I'm not really sure. Okay, Rabbi, you're going to have to repeat that because uh, it, it's yeah. Again, it's a question of contemporary the contemporary mm -hmm. situation comparing. The danger from Christian nationalism in Boston to Islamic radicalism. So um, the the National Socialists who are active in Boston are uh, secular in nature. So my original investigations into them, I presumed that they would have a Christian nationalist foundation. But in fact, they're entirely secular in their in, in their uh, in their view. What they remind me of a lot is the um, George Lincoln Rockwell movement of the 1960s with the American Nazi Party. Now that that movement um, left Christian nationalism in the 50s. There there was a Christian nationalist. Um, influence of a, a Reverend Gerald L.K. Smith on Rockwell as he founded his American Nazi Party. But then the American Nazi Party left religion at the door and they became kind of their own political movement uh, and then later moved on into the race question in terms of civil rights. I kind of see that happening here now in the contemporary situation. Um, so AC, uh, ACA 131, which is anti-communist action 131, that group in New England doesn't have any, never makes any claims to any religious principles at all. Um, so their, their Judeo-Bolshevism, as I see it, is, is, is unconnected to, to religion. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I would need to do, I'm not sure I, I buy it. Like, I think I think that they're deliberately publicly uh, eschewing Christianity because uh, because they don't want to drag uh, other Christians into their into their mix. That's my hunch. I don't have any evidence for that, but I think the the question is a good one because because I think what we're seeing is is somewhat unexpected and a little bit new, and yet I think. I think we need to we need to figure out what these impulses are that are pushing it forward. Now, granted, too, these are fringe organizations, but on the other hand, the Christian Front of the 1930s was a fringe organization, which ultimately had 100,000 members. So, you know, that's something that I that's a, a space I have to keep my eye on, and um, I'm kind of as a historian getting dragged into these contemporary discussions simply because they seem to be kind of um, kind of not repeating themselves, but there are echoes of all this in, in the contemporary situation. Uh, Dr. Vinick, remind me of the question was, can you probe more deeply into the, gener the Generation Zers 
on how on the dynamic of anti-Israel and how that bleeds into anti-Semitism. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. So anti-Israel sentiment is something that um, is pervasive when it comes to modern anti-Semitism, largely because, and I believe I said this in my initial remarks, um, it's very socially awkward, again, as it should be to say, I don't like Jews, but it has become increasingly socially acceptable, particularly in certain circles, to say, I don't support Israel, and therefore I don't welcome those who do. Um, just this week at, I believe, UC Berkeley um, in the law school, they adopted new bylaws that say they will never invite any speakers that support Israel or Zionism. This is nine different groups of law school students at UC Berkeley. And if we know that uh, the vast majority of American Jews do support Israel, the majority of American Jews identify as Zionists with varying degrees of what that means from the left to the right um, and in different contexts, it's effectively saying if you support Israel, you aren't welcome in this space is effectively developing a Jewish free zone, not exclusively a Jewish free zone. There are, of course, many non-Jews who support Israel and also, according to these definitions, wouldn't be welcome in these spaces. But for the Jewish community in particular, this is an increasing problem. For Gen Zers, many Jewish, the majority of Gen Zers, Jewish or not, identify as universalists. They see themselves as citizens of the world. To be a particularist is countercultural in the nomenclature of an American Gen Zer. Um, Judaism by nature is particular, as is Zionism. So it, when it comes to questions of Israel, there is definitely a support of Israel, but it's not inherent for many, particularly non-Orthodox Jewish Gen Zers. It's something that has to be taught, something that has to be learned and absorbed in um, a way that cannot necessarily be left just to enculturation. And we have this issue where these Gen Zers are hit regularly, particularly on social media, but also in uh, in-person life with challenges to the perception or the reality of their support of Israel, questions about what it means to uh, be Jewish and be expected to be a voice for Israel, whether or not they've been there, whether or not they figured out what their own perspectives are on Israel, whether or not they feel in any way confident or qualified or equipped to answer these questions. It's a huge challenge because it means that at these pivotal moments when the Jewish community, Jewish educators want to instill a sense of connection with Israel, a potential love of Israel, they're then in this space where it's, sorry, uh, invasion, um, where the issue becomes defending Israel rather than meaningfully being in relationship with Israel before automatically being asked to step up in this sense of defense. Um, there is absolutely a time for Israel advocacy, but for Gen Zers not to have a chance to develop personal relationships before being asked to step into those roles of advocates, in my opinion, will ultimately have a negative impact on their ongoing relationships with Israel. That's why a lot of Jewish organizations are working to bring Israel education um, in proactive ways at younger ages so that those relationships can develop in meaningful ways. And then before we go, there'll be closing remarks from Brett. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Sussman, you, you mentioned, if, if I may describe it as such, that a wake-up call for you that, that we had crossed the tipping point was the Tree of Life shooting. Um, I'm wondering uh, your reactions to uh, things that preceded that, Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam and his popularity, some of the Muslim uh, Brotherhood Front groups that were stirring up Jew hatred, the, the Saudi and Qatari propaganda that was stirring Jew hatred, things like that. Were they not wake-up calls for you? So the, the tipping... Yeah. Um... The reference to the Tree of Life had to do with my granddaughter and how that changed the dynamic in the family. She was simply too young to have um, experienced that uh, for myself. Um, 
yes, there there is this legacy, um, and it's part of the complexity of Jewish Black relations in in the United States, and it and it. It's complex because on the one hand, the Jewish Black Alliance uh, is central to the Democratic Party in the United States. That's how Democrats win votes. They bring together different groups. Republicans bring together different groups. And there, there are problem groups on the left and there are problem groups on the right. One of the problem areas for Jews and the Democratic Party has to do with the specifics of Jewish Black relations. And it is a difficult, complex uh, conversation. Uh, I think most polls show that the incidence, we don't like to talk about this, but the incidence of anti Semitism, traceable anti Semitism or expressed anti Semitism, is generally higher in the African American community than it is in the general white community. On the other hand, uh, some of the alliances uh, common for political purpose are extremely strong. Extremely strong, so it's it's not a monolithic uh, landscape by any by any stretch. Jews and blacks live together mostly in the urban centers in the United States, and they form these practical um, coalitions. On the on the other hand, there's a big white America out there, which the Jewish community does not have much contact with, and statistically much much bigger. Than, uh, than the black community, and it, it and has also taken on on the fringes um, the the the, uh, the language of virulent anti-Semitism. I think what the Jewish community is sensing, this is a subjective personal opinion, is America is overwhelmingly white. It is still. And uh, it's still the biggest block of people, even when they would, even when whites become the minority, and overwhelmingly Christian. And the danger of radicalization is greater for the majority than it is for a minority group. And I think that's where I'm trying to interpret the landscape for you of American Jewish life. So I think there is a greater concern about what happens if the majority culture is radicalized against the Jewish community. I think that's the perception that. I hear in in the in the community. There are so many different groups and pockets. I'm trying I'm trying to generalize it to to show the overall landscape. So they're very difficult and important questions. I don't know if it's Naomi or Zev or whoever's going to wrap this up. Uh, thank you. All right, thanks, Naomi, and thank you. So congratulations again, Rabbi Sussman, on the award, the Gratz Medal. And thank you to Dr. Samantha vinegar meinreff Father Gallagher, uh, President Ellis. Um, thank you for your very thoughtful presentations. Uh, you gave us a lot to think about and to, uh, to you know, really consider about uh, the world, the state of the world today. So thank you and to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, it's really wonderful to see you. We hope you'll join us for upcoming programs. We have two fall programs right around the corner, uh, October 13th, just in time for Sukkot. We have uh, uh, Dr. Josh Teplitsky from Penn speaking about the Etrog. Should be a wonderful uh, lecture. And, uh, and then right after that, November 6th is our biennial uh, the Est Arnold and Esther Tuz Memorial, Memorial Holocaust Teach-In. It's a full day of learning. You can participate remotely. You can participate here in the building. Uh, it's a full day of learning, and it's a wonderful, incredible event. It is featuring uh, sessions throughout the day, but the feature presentation is a conversation between uh, Erwin Kotler of the Raoul Wallenberg Center in Toronto and uh, Alicia Wiesel. So it'll, it promises to be a great event. So just my little plug for our future programs. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, not just those who register, but also those who gave generously to support uh, a scholarship fund in honor of Rabbi Sussman. So thank you for, to those who gave. It's not too late if you would still like to contribute um, and, uh, and to support uh, the work we do at Gratz College. We're growing. It's an exciting place. Lots going on. So stay plugged in. Have a good night. And thank you. <laughs>